Hi, thanks for joining me. My name is Kerry Farlow. I have the pleasure of serving as the associate pastor here at Community Church at Ocean Pines, and this is our 915 Contemporary Service via the internet. And I'm so glad um, that you're joining us for this. Uh, I hope this is a blessing to you. We'd love to see you in person, but of course, if you can't make it, we're hoping that this can bless you in some way. Uh, I today have the privilege of um, uh, doing the worship here today and actually in all three services. This is a day that senior pastors love to take off and I do not blame them. It's the week after Easter, so the associate pastors like myself as, and many others across this country get an opportunity to preach and lead worship and I for one am very honored to be in that position. Uh, I'm going to excuse my uh, outfit here. Um, this is uh, kind of funny. This is actually the second time that we've taped this. Um, we're taping it today on Saturday. Usually we tape it on Wednesday. Uh, this week we taped it on Friday. But long story short, I had a whole nother outfit on. But our wonderful um, content uh, maker and producer, Ted, had some issues with the camera. So I said, Ted, no problem. We'll do it again. But that's why I'm not as dressed up as I normally would be, so I apologize for that. But again, I thank Ted for everything that he does around here. He works so hard to make this media available for you guys. And with that, let me begin with an opening prayer. Lord, we hear your calling. How can we keep from singing? How can we keep our lips from proclaiming the good news that Jesus Christ is risen, bringing healing and forgiveness to all? From the life in his blood, he has freed us, making us a royal priesthood. Whether we have seen or believe without seeing, we have found life in his name. And in Christ's name, we give thanks and praise. Amen. Today's scripture uh, comes from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And allow me to read that for you this morning. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and who through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So again, here we are the Sunday after Easter and we are continuing to celebrate uh, the event the, the event of victory over sin and death that was by Christ's resurrection. And as I said before, this is a day where associate pastors like myself get a chance to preach, and I am honored to be in this position. Uh, I began thinking about what I wanted to preach on a few weeks ago, and after some prayerful consideration, I settled on this. And the title of my sermon is Revelation. And I just want to put everybody at ease right off the get-go that I'm not preaching on the book of Revelation, the last book in our New Testament. That's not really something that I want to tackle right now. But I'm going to be preaching on the doctrine of Revelation and what that means and what that is. And Revelation is part of what Christian theologians call the local communes of Christian theology, which is like a really fancy Latin way of saying the basics, right? Things like salvation, sanctification, justification, revelation. But simply put, revelation is God revealing. Uh, it could also mean something like making the hidden known. Um, but this morning, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about how God makes himself and his character and his will known to us. Now, to begin, let me give you this analogy, and this will help explain why I think revelation is important. God is a personal being, and we are personal beings. Um, this is something we as human beings share with our Creator, having been made in His image. And if I want to get to know one of my fellow human beings, how would I go about that? Well, if you wanted to get to know me, uh, you could look at me, you could study me, 
you could um, draw my blood and and study it maybe and test my DNA if you're a really good doctor or some sort of scientist you could hook electrodes up to my head and study my brain activity but you're not gonna find me in any of that um, you're not gonna find out anything about my will about my favorite song my favorite color or how much I love my family um, if you want to know any of that I have to reveal it to you and if I can put this this way I think that's kind of how it goes with God and the way I see it God has revealed himself in at least four ways um, and I want to talk to you about those today and God's revelation is certainly not limited to these four things uh, these are just the four that I chose to talk about and theologians usually make a distinction between two types of revelation there's general revelation and then there's special revelation I'm gonna give you two examples of each and talk about them a little bit and then of course I want to talk about how we can apply this to our everyday lives our relationships with one another and of course our relationship to God um, these first two examples are gonna be general revelation and they're general in two senses they're general in one because um, they're accessible to all people regardless of who they are or what century they were born in but they're also general in a sense that they're they're very generic type of revelations um, by this general revelation you may know that God exists but you may not know that he's triune that would require some special revelation the Apostle Paul writes in the book of Romans he says for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have clearly been seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. So, creation. This is probably the first revelation of God that really spoke to me as I came into my own faith. Um, of course, when I was a kid, my parents um, told me about God. My dad told me about who Jesus was and what he did. Um, but this was the first real experience that I had as I grew into my own faith and the first experience I had with God was in his creation if you've spent any time out on the water or outdoors or in nature um, you'll soon recognize that God is everywhere and his fingerprints are all over creation I saw this clearly as a young man um, in the migratory patterns of fish and birds and I saw it in the design and the complexity of nature uh, let me give you a, a thought experiment here. If you were walking along the seashore and you came across something written in the sand, something like, Ted was here, um, you would be right in assuming that there was some sort of mind or intelligence behind that. You know, it's just a simple phrase, right? It's just three words, maybe a dozen letters. But it would be painfully obvious to you that there was some sort of intelligence behind that. No one in their right mind would think that it was just the waves crashing on the beach that would have created that. Now let's just for a moment look at a much longer phrase or word. How about the longest word known to man? And our genetic code is 6.4 billion, that's uh, with a B, letters long. Uh, Francis Collins, who is a committed Christian, and he was one of the leaders of the Human Genome Project. They were some of the first people to successfully map the human genome. Francis calls this the language of God, and he has a really good book by the same name. And it seems to me that if we can attribute intelligence to just that simple phrase that we would find on the beach, on a seashore, um, we certainly could do the same for something like that so creation uh, another example of God's general revelation to us is our conscience and it seems to me that we all have a general sense of right and wrong um, if I was asked by a non-christian how I know right from wrong part of my answer would be pretty much the same way that you do um, we all kind of have a sense of this uh, I will receive some pushback sometimes on that though um, some people may say that different cultures view morality differently. Um, I like what C.S. Lewis had to say about this. C.S. Lewis says, If anyone will take the trouble to compare the moral teachings of, say, the ancient Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Hindus, the Chinese, the Greeks, and the Romans, what will really strike him will be how very likely they are to each other and to our own. And he continues, he says, think of a country where people were admired for running away in battle, 
or where a man felt proud of double-crossing everyone who had been kindest to him. Men have differed as to whether you should have one wife or four, but they have always agreed that you must not simply have any woman that you liked. So while yes, um, while morality does differ between cultures superficially, uh, fundamentally there is this standard unto which we have, like Paul said, written on our hearts. Um, creation and conscience. This is part of God's general revelation. It's accessible to all people throughout time, regardless of location. Uh, the conclusion that I draw from this, and Paul is pointing out in Romans, is that from this we can, one, know that God exists, and that two, we are indeed accountable to him. So as far as special revelation goes, we get a really heavy dose of this uh, every Sunday morning here at Community Church. Um, and this, of course, is Holy Scripture. Uh, let me give you a quick story. Um, I've been living here my whole life, um, working in a seasonal family business, and I'm always busy in the summertime, working like 80, 90 hours a week. But in the wintertime, the off season, um, I have some time on my hands, and it used to be that the hardest part of my day was deciding whether I wanted to go fishing or hunting or play golf, but that was before I had kids. and. I don't like being bored, um, so the fall was nice, uh, bills were paid, I had money, but the springtime would come around and I'd be scrounging through my couch looking for coins, and I had to work. So I, I did all kinds of things. I did everything from working at another restaurant part-time or helping a friend landscape or helping my father in his woodworking business, but one winter uh, a friend had an electrical con uh, contracting business and he gave me a job. I told him, I said, I don't know anything about electricity. And he said, that's fine. He said, I could learn on the job. So uh, I did kind of lie there, though. I did know something about electricity, and I knew two things about electricity. I knew that I could cook my dinner with electricity, and I knew that I could cook myself with electricity. But the first couple days I spent with him, he was kind of showing me the ropes. And the fourth or fifth day I was with him, we were hooking up a hot tub in North Ocean City for a guy and I had to put a breaker in a panel. It was my first time doing this and he kind of explained to me what to do. And of course I was new to this and I was kind of um, inexperienced. And long story short, I ended up getting a pretty good zap from the bar that runs down the back of the uh, panel. And that was a shocking experience, pun intended, right? But ever since then, moving out through this uh, time as an electrician, I was very weary of the power of electricity. And after that, for the next few weeks, we were in new construction, pulling wires through houses that had no electricity running through them. They were cold wires. I could do anything I wanted with them. Uh, but a little bit after that, I was sent on a service call with one of the other guys, and we had to put in an outlet in, in a bathroom and put up a ceiling fan. So the foreman, we'll call him, he took me into the uh, bathroom, showed me where to put the outlet, and he said he was gonna put up the ceiling fan. And I said, okay, and I started following him out the room. And he said, uh, where are you going? And I said, I'm gonna go turn the power off. And he said, why would you do that? And I said, so I don't die. What kind of question is that? And that's when he told me that, well, he said, why don't you work it hot? And I, I said, work it hot. Like, why would I want to do that? Then he called me a name. He called me a scaredy cat. Um, actually, he called me something far worse than that, and I'm not going to repeat it here, um, but I didn't like that. And I know sticks and stones will break my bones, but I did not want to be known as what this guy called me. So I did it. I, I worked it hot with live electricity going through the wires. And let me tell you, working with wires that have live electricity running through them is way different than working with wires that do not. Just that knowledge changes your entire approach. Um, you have to be very mindful about what you're doing and how you're doing things. And this, my friends, is precisely what we have in Scripture. We have a live wire. And this just, this isn't like 110 coming out of your outlet that you plug your coffee maker into. This is like a power line down in your front yard. Um, the author of Hebrews says that 
The Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. If we went to the library right now for a small group meeting and we all sit in the comfy chairs with our coffee and we begin and I pull out a razor sharp double edged sword, the first thing that somebody is going to say is careful with that. And that's precisely what we have in scripture. We're dealing with live wires. This is powerful stuff and it demands diligence and respect. Um, it's not something to play around with because it's, it's dangerous. Now, of course, we can't turn the power off to Scripture, but what we can do is kind of turn ourselves off to it. And we do this when we read Scripture like it's a blog post or a recipe for cornbread or something like that, rather than something that judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Uh, we need to handle it with care and treat it like it should be treated. So creation, conscience scripture and if you haven't guessed the fourth one yet uh the greatest and final and by by far the greatest revelation of god to us is jesus himself our scripture today though talks about prophets and i just want to say a quick word about them there's some tough jobs out there uh, commercial fishermen farmers lumberjacks police officers nurses hot tar roofers and of course anybody um, that's involved is a school teacher, a daycare worker, or anybody in youth ministry. Those are really tough jobs, but I think Old Testament prophet definitely takes the cake. Uh, this was a tough calling. They lived strange lives. Some had families, some did not. Some were married, some were not. Some were probably wish they were never married, uh, guys like Hosea. Um, and they were often speaking things that people did not want to hear. Uh, American philosopher, economist, and social critic Thomas Sowell famously said that when you tell someone what they need to hear, you're loving them. But when you tell someone what they want to hear, you're loving them s yourself. And this is what the prophets would do. Um, it was hard telling people what they needed to hear, and it cost uh, many of them their lives because of this. Of course, the uh, prophets weren't exclusive to the um, Old Testament. We have people like John the Baptist in the New Testament. But all of these guys and gals were leading up to the greatest prophet, the final and greatest revelation to us, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, the Messiah. And I've gone into a lot of detail talking about all these other um, different revelations of God to us. But I can sum up this one in one simple sentence. And that is a quote from Jesus himself. And Jesus says in John 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He showed us how to live. He showed us what true love really is and how to live according to the will of the Father perfectly. Um, I'm gonna close with just this quick story. The other day I took my daughter to Salisbury um, she had the day off from school and I had stuff to do, but I thought we could have a little fun together. So I was driving her to Salisbury. I didn't tell her where we were going. I was going to surprise her. And I was actually taking her to the music shop. I had a, my eye on a new guitar for her or a drum kit. And we went up to the store and she ended up getting a little blue ukulele, which um, really pleased my wife because it was significantly cheaper than the guitar and also it wasn't a drum kit. Um, but on the way up there, we were listening to music, and her favorite song right now is Raise a Hallelujah by Bethel. And we're like listening to this song on repeat. And when we get to the end of the song, she makes me repeat it over again. But finally, I said, let's just listen to the next song. This one's kind of wearing me out. And the next song that came on uh, my phone was a song called Only Jesus by Casting Crowns. And it's a song that I had heard before. Um, but I never really paid attention to it that closely. And as the song was playing, and my daughter's in the back seat, um, a line from the song really kind of struck me. And it said, I don't want to leave a legacy. I don't care if anybody remembers me, only Jesus. And I lost it. Uh, that hit me like a kick to the chest, and I started crying. 
uh, I, I, in my mind, I looked at my life and everything that I have, my wife, my kids, um, and sometimes I can't completely understand how the God of the universe, the almighty, sovereign, all-powerful, supremely great creator would not only allow me to live, but allow me to know him and be fully known by him and fully loved by him. Uh, he not only allows me to simply exist, but he blesses me with so many things. Everything that I have, uh, my kids, my wife, my job, a place to call home. And the only thing above all those things, uh, the one thing that can define my life as a success is if I can just simply point someone to him. Uh, because when it's all said and done, I really, I really don't care if anybody remembers me. I just want them to remember Jesus, who he is and what he did for us. And that would make my life successful. Thanks be to God. All right, ready?
So thank you for joining us for this online ministry, online worship of our contemporary service. Uh, we hope that you can be here in person for us. We have three services. We got one at eight o'clock, our casual service. We have our 915 contemporary service, and then we have our 1030 traditional service. We'd love to see you in person and worship with you in person. But again, we hope that this was a blessing to you being able to watch this online. Again, thank you to Ted, our content producer, uh, director, editor, and everything else. He does a wonderful job here and he's one of the greatest volunteers we have. This church is just filled with awesome people and it really makes uh, what I do a pleasure here. So thanks thanks to all of them for that and thank, thank you to you for, for watching this. I'm going to close with this prayer. Go from here as witnesses of what you have seen and heard. Share God's love with those you meet. Bring hope to those who are in despair live lives of gratitude and praise, and may the love of God, the peace of Jesus Christ, and the ongoing presence of the Holy Spirit be within you and among you until we meet again. Amen. Thank you and have a wonderful week.